harassment and violence. It's endemic, isn't it, in the trade union movement. We haven't got our own house in order. We have trade unions, we put demands on employers um, around safer workplaces, equality in the workplace, but they don't apply that to their own staff. We all know what goes on, but the climate of fear in the trade unions means that a lot of officers feel that they can't speak up about it. You only have to look over the last few years. It's there. It's like a, this open secret that people don't necessarily talk about. There seems to be a dislike particularly of competent women officers. I think it threatens their power. It's a very deeply sexist culture and abuse is ignored and overlooked. Women are spoken about in a denigrating way regularly and repeatedly. It's like a wound. If you don't clean it out, then you're going to end up with a separating sore. I've seen a lot of good women full-time officers leave over the past few years who had started off full of enthusiasm, full of life, full of ideas, mainly happen to be socialist women. And then by the time that they've went through the mill of being treated badly by trade unions, they're really shadows of their former selves and it's really upsetting. There'll be people who will be slagging off any of the women that they know in this film. That's why you're going to get so few women speaking to you. When a woman comes forward about being harassed or discriminated in the workplace, there are very few options for her to fight. In terms of going to the employment tribunal, there isn't enough legal aid available. It's extremely difficult, especially when they're going through an extremely emotionally difficult situation like that, to launch a legal claim and fight it and win. How do you manage that huge contradiction between keeping your job, what you want to be true, that these blokes are good blokes, but you're seeing this behaviour that isn't like an ordinary workplace. When you're worrying about, you know, not being able to say there's an issue or um, about somebody acting inappropriately towards you, whether that be somebody more senior to you or within the branches, how can you possibly do your job properly? And on a member's perspective, if they can see that happening in our organisation, that it, where's the trust, you know, because we should be the beacons, we should be the gold standard as trade unions. The way some of the structures are established, it allows individuals to have too much power and to exercise that power through the structures. The structures that used to nurture and support and empower women have sort of faded away. They're not as strong as they used to be. As a young woman in the trade union movement, I found it difficult going from my branch into a full-time officer's role. Some of the, some of the um, branch secretaries didn't necessarily respect the fact that a young woman was coming in. Um, I've had inappropriate messages um, and I think now that I'm general secretary, one of my key things is no other employee in our union should have to go through what I went through. I was in a dispute at work. I was being bullied. I was terribly mismanaged. I was told very clearly by GMB, you have a case, you have a winnable case. Yeah, we'll fund you. By the time I got that, I felt so attacked and so out of my depth and so little support. You know, they'd withheld money from me. They tried to refuse giving me my contractual redundancy agreement. They know more than anyone else what employers' tactics are to break down employees. So they use those same tactics on their staff, on the women. I was psychologically fucking destroyed. One of the most traumatic things that's ever happened to me in my life. I couldn't carry on. There was no way I was going to go to a bloody employment tribunal with these powerful people who've been bullying you. A head of department, very, very, very senior person, started talking to me. He'd never spoken to me really before. I'd say hello to him in the corridor, but he suddenly started being friendly to me. I went back into the office, there was the bigger boss's secretary there, my immediate line manager there, female. The secretary said, this bloke is a shagger. He goes for the vulnerable ones. That's what he said. And I actually said as a joke, ah, that's why he's so interested in me then. And we all laughed, even though it was my line manager. So I think that says something about the culture. Another time, this bloke, I was sitting in the canteen. There's me, him, the young bloke, sweet guy. And there must have been a couple of other people there as well. 
somebody brought up one of the most senior women in the organisation. He said, Myra Hindley, that's our nickname for her, because one day she walked in the office and she used to have this dark hair and she dyed it all blonde. And then he said, I've shared my seed with her lunchtime in the canteen at head office. My young mate, he's such a junior member of staff and the training he is being given is that this behaviour is acceptable and excusable. If you act properly against sexism or sexist abuse against powerful men, you're going to go through hell. You see exactly those same people and all their associates at the next meetings you go to, at the next protest you go to. At the, they've got connections to your local Labour Party and you don't know what's being said about you. There are a number of trade union workers who are in uh, TUC affiliated unions where inter-union politics can play a role. GMB was our union for our group of workers. And the, what the line is, they say, I am in... Okay, GMB, for bargaining purposes only. The implication of that is that you're never going to need to rely on your trade union that you're a member of for any representation because you work in a trade union. We've seen some of our union branches in collusion with management and really not campaigning on the issues that they should be campaigning on because they don't want to upset the trade union. My first rep was absolutely completely chosen for us and in the pocket of our management, what ordinary rep in the trade union movement is going to go up against some trade union leading figure? I think that it comes down to a lot of the politics of people who are in charge of the unions in that if you don't agree with what we say, then we are going to make your life difficult. And it seems to be mainly women that we go for. I'm the co-founder, along with Professor McFarlane, of the campaign Can't Buy My Silence. And both of us have fallen foul of the misuse of non-disclosure agreements. Myself, probably slightly more infamously because it was with Harvey Weinstein. Julie didn't actually sign an NDA, but she ended up being sued for defamation because she spoke out about somebody at her university who the university had protected with an NDA. And this just shows the insidious and immoral use of NDAs when used incorrectly, which unfortunately has now become a sort of epidemic within the legal system. There's been, um, in recent years, a lot of controversy about whether these are ethical, whether these are the right things to do, um, especially gagging somebody who has done nothing wrong apart from being harassed or discriminated. But the reality of the situation is that they are still used every single day. All types of employers do this. A huge amount of NDAs aren't even enforceable. However, you're never going to go through the process of finding out if it's enforceable. You're not going to be able to afford to take it to court. So many women will say, this perpetrator has done this before in the organisation, other women have had to leave because of them, um, but the perpetrator remains, yet the victims are the ones that are forced to leave, and on top of that are silenced with these um, non-disclosure agreements, which means they can't talk about what's happened. The majority of people who have signed an NDA, I don't think I've met one who's not had a mental breakdown. moment when you're in that room being told to sign this you want to sign it you want to get it over and done with you want to get out of the room you don't ever want to see the person again you don't want to ever have to think about it again but actually that's when the real problems start because you then become complicit in a lie when you go for job interviews you can't explain and so you're the one that looks suspicious you there's a black hole in your life you cannot own 
your own story. You cannot speak about your own trauma. It increases the sense of guilt and shame, which all women feel when something dreadful's happened to them anyway. And so it's a really malicious, malignant way to deal with it. I do understand where people are coming from when they sign uh, non-disclosure agreements because they might think that this is the best that I can get. But really the use of non-disclosure agreements means that the abuse has happened and the cycle of abuse continues to happen. It's wrong that we put them in place to kind of silence women um, in order to protect the perpetrators because there's no other way of looking at it. That's exactly what it is. It's no better than, you know, some of our worst employers that we deal with doing exactly the same thing. We'll move the women, we'll shut them up, we'll leave the, the, the perpetrator doing what they're doing. Um, it's not good enough. There are women within the trade union movement who know that they are tolerating stuff that is completely unacceptable. But they also know that were they to challenge that, they would lose their jobs, they would lose everything. One of the other things that is throwing at us is that, you know, just be grateful that you're in a job. Our members are on a lot less pay than you are. Women don't feel believed and it's kind of brushed off as banter or, you know, well, it's the trade union movement and you've got to expect a bit of that and a bit of this. Um, but we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't have to expect that. And there's also the kind of, well, we don't want to make a big song and dance out of it because the right-wing media doesn't need any excuses to attack trade unions. But if it wasn't going on in the first place, there'd be no reason to attack the trade unions for it, would there? I think everything has to be in the open. We will be slagged off. Of course we will be slagged off. But the more we hide things when they come out, the, the worse it will be. When Dave Smith was writing his book about blacklisting, there were officers within the trade union movement who were suspected of having colluded in that blacklisting. The hierarchy of the trade unions made clear to him that if this comes out in a book like this, we'll have David Cameron in the House of Commons quoting from it. The blacklist support group dealt with it openly and honestly. They challenged the trade union movement. No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! In October of 2017, two words sent shockwaves throughout the world. The Me Too movement really kind of bolstered women's feelings towards tackling sexual harassment and violence. I think we've just got to keep that momentum going. Sisters to the Front is an organisation led by female trade union officials, for trade union officials and employees that don't currently have a space to come together as a network to support each other, to learn and to train. It's a safe space where we can talk about issues that we, only women in our movement and employees of our movement face. We got together in February 2020 a group of attendees put together a charter for general secretaries against sexual harassment and violence. It's basically, you know, don't use non-disclosure agreements and make sure that allegations are investigated properly and that the, the survivors aren't the ones that are being punished. Um, and just having a clear stance and policies, procedures in place internally. From our union's point of view, we started by putting a survey out to our members, which not only talks about their workplaces, but our union as well because I think we need to have a critical look at ourselves and our own behaviour before we kind of deal with the wider issues. Easy, but the more people that stand up when something is wrong, particularly when it's the law, you know, we have the power to change this, and we have the power to change legislation. And we're made and told to feel like we're powerless, but we're really not. Part by My Silence is a campaign to change legislation globally around the misuse of NDAs. They should not be being used in settlement agreements as a way of protecting abusive behaviour or malpractice. The most important thing for us is that people come and share their testimony on our website. Because of the nature of NDAs, there's very little data 
and there's very little information. And for legislation to be changed, you need data. It would be better if organisations, instead of feeling the need to cover up harassment and discrimination, if they used that money, that resource and that time actually tackling the root causes of that um, harassment and discrimination in the first place, who do training to introduce policies and to look at the parity of the workforce in terms of women, LGBTQ people and other minorities. In those kinds of environments, you're not going to have harassment and discrimination to such an extent and you don't need to put all your effort into covering up any harassment or discrimination. Set up a real rank and file bottom up women's network where we have really safe private spaces, knowing that we could all be completely open and honest and work out together how we can challenge it. We've got to have a culture and a, a, cult, a change in our culture that, you know, if somebody comes and says, I've got an issue and I'm experiencing this, that they believe and supported and it's tackled. We won't accept sexual harassment or violence and people that think that it's okay to behave like that have no place in our movement.